Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce the first speaker of this afternoon, Jose Luis Cisneros Molina. A um, few minutes we were having lunch and he told me that these are recent results related to a topic he investigated in his PhD at Warwick. So I'm really pleased to be here because I first met Jose Luis during those days when I was doing, we were students at Warwick University. Okay, so his, his talk is about characteristic classes of representations of finite subgroups of CL2C and the spectrum of the Kleinian singularities. Thank you very much, Lilian. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, to give this talk. I'm really, really excited. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first trip up post-pandemia. And also, well, it, it, we, we are here at, it, in the physical presence, at least one representative of each country. Since I'm the Mex only Mexican, I feel like I'm representing my, my Mexico and Alvaro Chile. <laughs> so, and... Uh, um, this, this is a, a recent joint work with Jose Antonio Arcine Ganevares and Agustin Romano Velasquez, both of them former students of mine. And, um, and well, I, I will uh, talk about a relation uh, between characteristic classes of representations and uh, the spectrum of linear singularities. So the natural way, the, the talk is divided in three parts. At first, I will uh, talk about these characteristic classes, then about some spectral invariants, and finally, in the case of Kleinian singularities. Okay, so first I remind what about classifying spaces. So if we have a topological group, G, uh, there exist uh, two spaces, uh, usually denoted by EG and BG, and there is uh, a map from EG to BG, uh, which is a principal G bundle. Uh, BG is called the classifying space of G, and EG, the, or, or P, the, the universal principal G bundle. These are unique up to homotopy. And, uh, well, the reason because this is called the universal principal G bundle is because if I would take any paracompact space X, uh, any principal G bundle over X is the pullback of this universal principal G bundle by some map from X to, to BG, which is usually called the classifying map of that particular principal G bundle. So in this way, we get a one-to-one -one correspondence between principal G bundles over X and uh, homotopy classes of maps between X and BG. And this construction is functorial in G. Also, we can consider G with the, instead uh, being a topological group with a discrete topology. And in this case, in, in the, when I, I do that, I will put this D here to, to indicate the discrete topology. In this case, the classifying space is an Eilenberg magnetic space of type KG1. That means that the fundamental group of this space is G, and all the higher uh, homotopy groups are the identity, are trivial. And of course, I can take the identity map, but first uh, in the domain with G with a discrete topology and, and G with its usual topology. Uh, of course, it's, it's continuous, a continuous map. And uh, we said that a principal G bundle over X with classifying map F is called flat if the classifying uh, map factorizes through uh, the classifying space of G with the discrete topology. No? And the reason it's called flat is because uh, when this happens, uh, any associated vector bundle 
over x uh, can be endowed with a flat connection. So uh, in this case, what we have is a one-to-one -one correspondence between flat uh, principal G bundles over x and homotopy classes of x between x and the classifying space of G with the discrete topology. Okay, so let the x be a compact space. And so we, ha we will have also a one-to-one -one correspondence between principal G L and C bundles and complex vector bundles of rank N over X. So what we do is we take, well, the, the associated bundle uh, with respect to the uh, natural uh, action of G L and C in CN. That gives us a one-to-one -one correspondence between ve complex vector bundles of rank N over X and uh, omotic classes of between X and the classifying space of G L and C. And uh, analogously, uh, between uh, uh, correspond one to one correspondences between flat vector bundles over X of rank N, these homotopy classes, but now with the classifying space taking the discrete topology, and also these these are correspondence between uh, uh, homomorphisms from the fundamental group of X to G L and C. No? From here to here, you just take the, the classifying map and then take the, the homomorphism induced in fundamental group. Okay, so now if we take a discrete group and a representation no, of, of dimension N, well, by the correspondence I, I previously mentioned, uh, it corresponds to a map no, from the classifying space of G to the classifying space of the general linear group with discrete uh, topology and to this map corresponds a flat complex vector bundle over the classifying space, which I will denote B sub row to indicate corresponds to this, this representation. And the definition of the cave churn class of the representation is just the cave churn class of this vector bundle, no? And is a cohomology class of a degree 2K. And we will say that a representation is topological trivial if the corresponding vector bundle is trivial, is topologically trivial. And uh, one property of the first churn class that we will use later is that the first churn class of our presentation equals the first churn class of its determinant, where uh, the determinant is just the determinant homomorphism from GLNC to GL1C. Okay, so this is uh, class, cl churn classes of our representation. And also we have what they are called secondary characteristic classes. So for this, uh, the easiest way to do it is take now a compact manifold M and a representation of the fundamental group of the manifold. We have, as before, a corres corresponds to this representation, a flat complex vector bundle. And uh, use, using Chernbyl theory to construct classes, characteristic classes, we get a, the ram churn class. We, this is a, a, a differential form, a closed a, a differential form in a closed differential form, which represents a, a cohomology class in, in degree two k with coefficients in c. And since a v row a, admits a flat connection, a, this class is zero, and this. A, these uh, classes uh, fit in the following exact sequence. Take this exact sequence of coefficients. We have associated a long exact sequence. Uh, here we have the, the, the Ram churn class no, in, in, with coefficients in C, which because uh, it has a flat connection is zero. The, the, the chain class, the usual chain class with integer coefficients uh, maps to this, uh, the Ram churn class. So this goes to zero, so that means is in the image of this map. So uh, there is a, a way, of course, it can be many pre-images of the, of the churn class, but there is a canonical way to take one. Uh, this is, it has to do with the uh, chigger chimons uh, differential character group, but I, I, I don't have time to explain this, but there is a precise uh, pre-image, which is called the churn chigger chimons class. 
and is, uh, it, it lives in this uh, cohomology group, one degree less, and in coefficients C mod Z. So we have the usual term classes and this secondary characteristic classes. They are called secondary because this class is zero. Okay, okay now, um, uh, with this uh, homology classes, we can define numbers as usual. So again, we take our compact. Now I will uh, restrict to uh, manifolds of dimension three. And uh, I take, uh, again, a representation. And by the universal coefficient theorem, and since this is divisible, we will have this isomorphism. This cohomology group is isomorphic to homomorphisms from the integer homology group to C of mod Z. And uh, so it, 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 with this isomorphism, we can see this chern Chigert simons classes as homomorphism from homology to C mod Z. Now we assume that the first homology group, sorry, it should be M here, has only one generator. And, uh, and, and uh, suppose we well, you know by M, the fundamental class in H3. So we can define characteristic numbers. The first uh, Chigger chain uh, Simons class evaluated in the generator of H1 gives us a number here. And the second uh, Chigger chain Simons class, which it lives in, a, in, in th third hom homology group evaluated in the fundamental class in in the third homology group gives us again a, a number here. So we have two numbers, just two numbers because we are restricting to dimension three. Okay, so this is basically the first invariance I'm going to be using. Okay, so this is in, in the side of representations. Now I will define some spectral invariants for uh, operators in a manifold. So, so I want to define the eta and C invariants defined by Atiyah, Patodi, and Singer. So we take M, a closed Riemannian manifold, and a vector bundle over M, and a self a join elliptic operator acting on the sections of this vector bundle. Since the operator is self adjoint, it has a real spectrum. And since it's elliptic, the, 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 the spectrum is discrete. So we can define this series, which is called data series, which is just the sum over all the eigenvalues which are different from zero, taking the module of the eigenvalues to the minus s, s is a complex variable, and multiplying by the sign of. So it's like a difference of two theta functions. And uh, this series converges when the real part of S is big, and by some, some theorems of Seeley, we can extend this to a meromorphic function in the whole uh, complex plane, and at zero, it is, uh, has a finite value. So the, the value at zero, which I will denote just like this, is called the eta invariant of the operator. And since this eta series does, does not take in, into account the zero eigenvalues, we make this uh, refinement, which what we do is we add the dimension of the kernel of, of the operator and divide over two. And the value in zero is what we call the psi invariant of the operator. And these are spectral invariants, which measures the asymmetry of the spectrum of the operator. And well, uh, Atiyah, Patoy, Singer use this to, to give a a generalization of the Atiyah index, Singer index theorem for manifolds with boundary, and this was the contribution in the boundary. Okay, and then now uh, we, we take into account re representations. We take a representation of the fundamental group of the manifold, and we take the corresponding flat vector bundle, which is defined in this way. They take the universal cover of M and alpha, with, uh, the fundamental group acts in the universal cover as usual, and also in seen by the representation, and it's just the quotient by the action. And uh, we can couple this uh, some uh, self-adjoint elliptic operator 
to this uh, vector bundle to get a new uh, twisted operator, which acts in the sections now of our uh, vector bundle E tensor with this uh, vector bundle B row. And in general, this new operator is not self-adjoint, but it has a self-adjoint symbol, and this is enough to define this eta series. If the representation is unitary, then we get a self-adjoint operator. And now we can compare this. We uh, uh, define the reduced psi invariant with respect to the representation row is just the difference of the psi invariant of the twisted operator minus the untwisted uh, psi invariant times the dimension of the representation. Okay, this is called the reduced uh, it invariant. And the nice property of this uh, number is that uh, if we uh, quotient modulo, we take the, the value modulo, the integers, is a homotopy invariant of the operator. Okay, so, so this is the spectral invariant. And then uh, with this um, invariant, we can define an index. So again, we, uh, we have the same hypothesis. We have our uh, self adjoint elliptic operator. And the homotopy class of this operator depends only on the homotopy class of the leading symbol of the operator. And if we take the contagion bundle of M, we will get a bijection between the stable classes of self adjoint symbols on M and the first uh, K, uh, K theory group of the contagion bundle. Uh, well, here, this stable classes is just a um, equivalence relation in the, in the set of symbols, but I, I, I don't want to define it here. And if I fix a representation row, then the map which sends A to its, its uh, reduced psi invariant, as I said, this is a homotopy invariant, so it only depends on the leading symbol. So that give, will give a, a map from the symbol to C mod set. And this is what Atiyah, Pato, and Singer call the topological index, sorry, the analytical index of the operator with respect to the representation. No? So this is a, a, an index, a top, an analytic index. And well, as you can imagine, since this is, has to do with Atiyah Singer index theorem, we also have a topological index. Now, again, we take our representation, and from this representation, we can define an element. Sorry, this is, uh, it should be minus k minus one, the k theory, first uh, k theory group of M, but with, with coefficients in C mod set. And this, there is a pairing from this, to, within these two groups, which gives an element in k zero of the cotangent bundle. This should be minus because minus plus, minus one plus one is zero. And there is also um, a homomorphism from this K0 group to C mod set, which is basically the usual topological index of a Dian Singer, but tensor with C mod set. So uh, then we can define a new topological index, which what it does is takes this, the symbol of an operator, and then, well, the symbol is multiplied no, but by this pairing with the element given by the representation, and then take this homomorphism. So this gives a, a new homomorphism from K1 uh, of the cotangent bundle to C mod set. And this is the topological index of the operator with respect to representation rho. And the index theorem for flat bundles says that with if the, 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 the dimension of the manifold is odd, then the two indices coincide, no? the analytic index with respect to rho and the topological index. And as I said before, if the representation happens to be unitary, then we have uh, the twisted operators are also unitary and the, the indices have values not in C mod set, but in R mod set. So for instance, if the fundamental group is finite, we will have values in R mod set. 
Okay, so, and the our first result is that um, this uh, second uh, Chigger Chern Simon class of um, of the uh, of the of a representation row of the fundamental group of a manifold. No, so we have again a, a, a compact oriented three manifold, and we will take uh, well since it's a compact three manifold, it's a spin manifold. It has a spin bundle and a, a, a Dirac operator. So we take the Dirac operator on M. I will call delta its uh, leading symbol, or the, the, well, the symbol class in, in this K-theory group. I take a, a, a representation row of its fundamental group. And I will uh, assume that it's topological trivial. No, this is important. It's topologically trivial. Then the second characteristic number of rho and the topological index with respect to rho will coincide. And so, in other words, one way to compute this topological index is uh, computing this uh, secondary characteristic number. And since by the index theorem of, of flat bundles, the topological index is the same as the analytic index. So in other words, this second, second Shiger chain class number of M of the row can be computed using this reduced C invariant, but only for topologically trivial representations. Okay, so, okay, so then we have a, in, a characteristic numbers of representations we have a spectral invariance, and we saw that in, in, in particular case, for three manifolds, the Dirac operator and topologically trivial representations, they coincide, the second uh, characteristic number and the indices. Now, uh, I want to relate this with Kleinian singularities. Um, so, well, just a quick re a reminder about Kleinian singularities. If we take the group, the Lie group SL2C, and we, well, we know the classification of the finite subgroups. No, the finite subgroups are conjugate to finite subgroups of, of SU2. So it's enough to compute the finite subgroups of SU2, which are the following cyclic groups binary dihedral, binary tetrahedral, binary octahedral, binary icosahedral, uh, which this is our um, like uh, two coverings of the rotation groups of the platonic solids. And if we take one of these finite subgroups of SL2C, the, these groups act uh, naturally no, by the action of SL2C and C2 by matrix multiplication. And the action is free except in the origin where we have a fixed point. So the, the Klein proved that this quotient is a complex surface with an isolated singularity given by the series zeros of certain polynomials these are the polynomials corresponding to the well corresponding finite subgroups. And uh, also later uh, Duval studied the, the, um, uh, the resolutions of these singularities and he computed the dual graphs of the resolutions and it turned out that they are linking diagrams of um, reducible uh, Lie algebras, which are, that's why we have up here the types of Lie algebras. That's why also these Kleinian singularities are called ADE singularities or Duval singularities. So, okay, so basically we will think of these Kleinian singularities as zeros of these polynomials, no? The hypersurfaces given by these polynomials or these quotients. And, well, just some pictures in the real surfaces of two of them. And uh, well, the, the singularities, the links, since these groups, uh, the action of ONC2 preserves the spheres, the link of, of, of these singularities uh, are, uh, uh, are the three sphere uh, modulo this, the action of these finite subgroups. Um, and um, so it, uh, they are of this way. I, the three sphere modulo the action of this because the, uh, the three sphere is isomorphic to SU2 and gamma is a subgroup of SU2. So it's just 
taking the action as a subgroup. And for the case when gamma is the binary cosahedral group, the link is this famous Poincaré homology free sphere. And uh, as Miriam said, uh, in, in, in my PhD, actually my first paper was to compute all these reduced psi invariants of the Iraq operator of these manifolds for any representation. And this uh, generalized uh, some formulas given by Seabe in the untwisted case. And at the time, I didn't know anything about singularities. Then when I went uh, back to Mexico and uh, Pepe invited me to work in singularities, I realized that these manifolds I work with were the links of these singularities. And I always had the question, are these numbers related with some invariant of singularity? For many, many years, I didn't have an answer, but today we have one. Um, so uh, for this particular case of Kleinian singularities, and well, a bit more generally for quotient singularities, uh, we can, um, we have uh, also a formula for the second uh, characteristic number, even when the, the representation is not topologically trivial. If it's not topologically trivial, what we do is, as before, take this reduced psi invariant, but we have to subtract the reduced psi invariant with respect to the, determin the determinant of the representation. And with this uh, formula, we can compute all the second, second characteristic numbers of the reducible representations of all the finite um, subgroups of SL2C. Okay, so, and for the first characteristic numbers, well, we have that the first homology group of the classifying space of gamma is precisely the abelization of, of gamma. And using this, one can see that there is a, a bijection between the first characteristic numbers of the representation of the group gamma and its abelianization. And uh, well, this is a formula given by Dupont uh, uh, that the first uh, characteristic number, as we, we said before, is of the representation is the same as the first characteristic number of the determinant and is given by this formula. So using this formula, and well, we have we, we know explicitly all the, uh, the reducible representation of these finite subgroups of SL2C. We can compute all these character characteristic numbers. And the now uh, I will talk about uh, an invariant of singularities, which is called the spectrum of a hypersurface singularity. So we take O, the ring of germs of holomorphic functions, and, and we take a function there. The spectrum of F is a multiset of mu rational numbers. Mu here is the Milner number. No, I, I, they are called spectral numbers, just, just, and, and they are ordered. And uh, this spectrum is an invariant of, of a singularity. If F and G are right equivalent, then they have the same spectrum. And in fact, if F is equivalent to the product of um, G with a unit, now we say that they are contact equivalent and also the, the spectrum is, they are the same. And well, they have uh, many uh, important properties, but the, the one I will, want to say here is that uh, if we take a, a spectral number and we take this uh, exponential, this is an eigenvalue of the cohomological monodromy. Okay, so this is an eigenvalue of the monodromy. So this related with the monodromy. So in other words, the spectral numbers are specific logarithms of the monodromy eigenvalues. Okay. And the, what we want now is to relate these characteristic numbers I, I talked before with these spectral numbers. And the way to do it is in the following way. We take uh, the, the germ of a quotient surface singularity. Well, in, in our case, we're thinking on Kleinian singularities in particular. 
and we take a representation of the link of the fundamental group of the link or of the, the group we are taking the action and we consider the minimal resolution and the exceptional divisor well has his uh, components and we consider the fundamental cycle no the, the fundamental cycle will be a, a linear com a combination of these exceptional divisors and we, 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 we have these numbers in i and what we do now is define the Xi invariant of the Dirac operator twisted by the representation and by the fundamental cycle. And it's just what we do is just take the reduced Xi invariant of the Dirac operator with respect to the representation, and we just multiply it by this number, which this, uh, this number in I comes from the fundamental cycle. And then the the theorem is that if we have a Kleinian singularity, we get we take the, the, the link and gamma is the fundamental group of the link, then all the spectral numbers can be computed using the link L via this twisted psi invariant and the characteristic numbers. So the recipe is as follows. All the first characteristic numbers are spectral numbers. And then this uh, reduced Xi invariator twisted by the natural representation, the natural representation no, into ESL to C, and the fundamental class is always of the form one over some integer. And this is also a spectral number. And then if we take multiples of this number with K is between one and M such that K and M are coprime, we recover the rest of the uh, spectral numbers. So let me show you an ex in, in some examples how we do it. So here, this is are the values of the of this twisted uh, sign variant by the, the representation and the fundamental cycle. This is for the binary dihedral the binary tetrahedral, tetrahedral, octahedral, and icosahedral. And we get these numbers, as I said, is the form one over something. Here, as I said, with, with a formula with a logarithm, uh, 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 we can compute all the, the first uh, uh, characteristic numbers, which are just one over L to L minus one over L. And since all this, because this, this corresponds to the cyclic group, so it's a billion, so all the representations are dimension one. And since we have dimension one, the vector bundles are of rank one, so they just have chain, uh, first chain class, not second. That's why all the, the secondary numbers are zero. Okay, so this is like one extreme, only first numbers and no second numbers. Here, we have both things. Using the formula, we can compute the first numbers. And to compute the second numbers, notice that uh, remember the first formula for the second numbers, you will use topologically trivial representations. And that corresponds to the representations with zero first number. So here we have zero. So the second uh, number is just this psi invariant. No, because here. These are the, the values of the Xi invariant I computed in my PSV. And here also we have zero, so it's precisely this number. Now to compute the others, remember that this also the Xi invariant minus the Xi invariant of the, of the determinant. And in this case, the determinant is, I think this representation row. So if we make the, 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 the subtraction, we get these numbers, no? So in this way, just from the information of the of these invariants and, 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 and the computation of the first numbers, we can get the second numbers. Here is the, the other extreme, because remember that uh, for this binary icosahedral group is perfect. So the abelianization is, is the trivial group. So there is no, we don't have any first numbers. No, and the second number, and, and so, since all are zero, all the representations are topologically trivial, 
So the second, the second characteristic numbers correspond precisely to the um, to the, this psi invariance. Now, how we construct these spectral numbers? Well, as I said, all the first numbers are, are spectral numbers, no? The, all these which are different from zero. And uh, then the, the, these values are also spectral numbers. And then if we take multiples of these, we, we recover all, all of them. So let me show you here. So as I said, for instance, in the case of the cyclic group, we have all the first numbers are spectral numbers. And we, we so all, all of them will be the spectral numbers that correspond exactly. Then for E6, we have one third and two thirds. And these correspond to four twelfths and eight twelfths. And, oh, sorry. Then we get a one twelfth, which is also here. And then you see, we take all the multiples, which are co-primed with 12. And the same thing for the rest here. Again, we have no first number. So what we do is we take the, this uh, twisted uh, invariant, which is 130, and which is a spectral number, and then we get all the multiples which are co-primed with 30. And we get precisely the spectral uh, numbers. And so this is very nice. Uh, now we have, well, this is an answer, no? If, if these numbers had a relation with an invariant of the singularity, well, this, this is the answer. And uh, you, you have to, I have to say that this relation is just like that. We, comp we got them but we don't know the reason. So you still, we have to, to it's like a, a Mackay type of observation. We have this, the same thing in these two sides, but uh, it just works like this, but uh, uh, a theoretical reason we still don't have. And also, well, I, um, I, I, I didn't put it in the slides because of time, I had to, but also if we have the, the singularity and we take the resolution, we can also compute this psi invariance in the resolution. So there is a, a formula, and this, this uses this Mackay correspondence, uh, which uh, relates um, uh, reflexive module, or modules with uh, some uh, called full shifts in, uh, upstairs. And um, so, so now, uh, well, when I started, doing singularities was I felt that I had like a double personality because on one side I was doing like all these spectral invariant things and I was doing the things on singularity. But now I, as Alberto Berhofsky says, in mathematics, everything is related with everything. We just need to find how. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, for this beautiful talk. Are there questions? Marcelo? Uh, I have a question. Just a, a remark. That's very interesting that you found the simple singularities of Arnold in this table. Uh -huh. Did you expect this before doing it, or it was the only possibility? Why not the others? Well, uh, of course, the, the idea was to look in the singularities because the manifolds I, I worked with was, were the, the links of these singularities. These results, uh, we have it a, a bit more general for quotient singularities, okay. and some of them also for just normal surface singularities. But uh, the, the, just the, the whole thing is for these singularities. And we are now trying to compute these uh, spectral invariants for other quotient singularities to see exactly the relation. This was my next question. So <laughs> you can, uh -huh. nice, very, you can do the, the inverse way, go from the, the other singularities, not only the simple, but exactly. the, you know, 
Okay. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. I'm not sure. I, I... May I ask a question? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I could follow you properly, but when you are at low dimension, you have this resolution of singularities and you have a lot of invariants related to the bundles that appear when you do this blow, blowing up and so on. And then the multiplicity or other invariants downstairs, we relate with this information upstairs. So you have a huge amount of information and I'm not sure, sure I could follow you, but you have something related with this kind of stuff for greater dimensions. Yes, in your work, I, I would like to understand better. Yeah, well, the, the, the main point here is well, these uh, spectral invariants were, are uh, this spectrum. Sorry, the spectrum of the singularity. Uh, in fact, I, I must confess, I, I, I still don't understand the, the original <laughs> definition very well. It has to do with mixed Hodge structures and these things, um, and and this is a way to to get them, but only from the link. No, you don't need the singularity because you have the link. You, you get the, the fundamental group, you get the, 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 the representations, and you get these uh, characteristic numbers. And also, in, in the last formula with this twisted um, uh, sign variant with the fundamental uh, cycle, it seems that you need information from the resolution to get this fundamental cycle. So you said, ah, but you are using there the, resolu the, the, the resolution and the, the singularity. But because of this Mackay correspondence, these numbers in the in the fundamental cycle are precisely the dimensions of the irre irreducible representations of the group. So really, it's just you take the link and you can produce these numbers without using the singularity. And this this is the nice thing. Well, now the other thing is compute them. No, I, I was able to compute them for these Kleinian singularities. We hope that the same procedure I used will uh, uh, give us the numbers for. There are other uh, uh, quotient singularities, no? But uh, but the the, 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 the this is the nice thing that you can compute them. You only using the information of the link, not the singularity. Hey, thank you. Very beautiful result. Thank you. We have so a nice. question <laughs> from Jean Paul. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we okay. do. So uh, I am very happy. So, so thanks a lot for your lecture. I, I enjoy, and I enjoy particularly because uh, the beginning of your lecture is exactly what was uh, more or less a uh, dream for me to to prove an index theorem for singular variety. Uh -huh. And uh, some ingredients already uh, are known. And you know, like uh, chain classes for singular variety by uh, Marianne Schwartz and McPherson, uh -huh. and uh, also chain character uh, by Bond, Pilton, McPherson, and also Marianne Schwartz has a theorem about the chain character. Uh -huh. Some people are doing, are looking at um, elliptic uh, operators, differential operators in case of singularity, like uh, people in Potsdam in Germany and in Toulouse as well in France. And I, I wanted to, to put everything together. And uh, so we have a signature, which is defined using uh, intersection homology. So we have uh, some ingredients for, for, for the proof of such uh, index theorem for singular varieties, but for the moment, my dream is still a dream. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. I hope so maybe some people will be able to look at this and to put all ingredients together to, to, to prove an index theorem, at least for some singularities, maybe yes. not for all kind of singularities. But, uh, yes, that would so, be wonderful if we manage to yeah, do yeah, that. It's a, it's a dream for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, thank you, Gampu. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a, a, a question. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's too simple one. So you you, ha you fix your representation, uh -huh. and you have the uh, analytical index and the topological index. And how are they related with the spectral numbers? OK. So the, the point is, the, the, this, uh, the quality of the, these two indices is that theorem by Atiyah, Patodi, and Singer. 
And what we are, are doing is that in this, we, we do use this particular uh, uh, hypothesis that the representation is topologically trivial. And then you take in the Dirac operator, these two ingredients are very important. Then this topological index is just this uh, characteristic number I defined at the beginning. And be, since the two indices are equal, then the other index is this spectral invariant. So in this way, using this uh, index theorem, we could relate these two. And the, the, the other thing is that having these numbers, uh, actually Agustin realized that if you put this extra coefficient there, you recover the spectrum. But it's, as I said, it's, we, we just did it, but why is the theoretical reason behind that? We, we still don't know. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And your operator, it's uh, you assume it to be elliptic. It's and, elliptic, self-adjoint. Elliptic. Yes. And is there a, a, a reason apart from making the computations and results? Well, so the, why, the, why? the reason of the Dirac operator is because um, remember that for constructing this topological index, we have a pairing. From the representation, you get an element in one K theory group. The, from the operator, you get a, another element with, with, given by the symbol. And, uh, well, uh, this, um, this uh, pairing is related with, uh, when you have a, a, a vector bundle, uh, there is a, 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 a Tom isomorphism. Well, uh, there is one in, in homology, in cohomology, but also in K theory. So when you take this in K theory, uh, what you do is you see the K theory of the total space of your bundle as a module on the, uh, on the K theory group of the base. And the, 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 for, the, for the Dirac operator, the, the symbol is precisely a generator as a, as a module. So you get all the symbols. Uh, when you take the, 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 the symbol of the Dirac operator and you make act the, the, the other the K group, you get everything. So it's like a generator. So, so that's why uh, this, the, uh, this, this is important to have this, okay. this operator. Uh -huh. I don't think that I'm, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. I, 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 oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just want to mention that it's nice to see Professor Jean Paul Brasselier with us, and I would like to say that next time we want to see you here, Professor. And thank you for coming. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Ok. So the next speaker of our talk, the second talk of this afternoon, is Rodrigo Mendes. He's from Unilab, Ceará. And his talk is about Lipschitz or metric geometry or of subanalytic sets via horns. OK. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for uh, uh, Firstly, I would like to thank the the organizers for this opportunity, the first talk of math in this wonderful event. In fact, I, I give a talk in the edition in Salvador, in Bahia. And the, how it's uh, again in this edition. Uh, well, today I will talk about uh, the, the, the Geometry, metric geometry of uh, uh, subanalytic sets uh, via horns. And, and this is a joint work with uh, Professor Dimitri Kerner and Levi Bihibai. Uh, let me start. Okay, but I don't know, maybe. Ah, cool. uh, so let me introduce this uh, category uh, such that this work uh, leads as a subanalytic set. As, as it means, uh, let me give a definition. So if we have an analytic Hell manifold, we say that X subset is subanalytic when the for each point belongs to M, you have a neighborhood such that this, this intersection is the projection of a relative compact semi-analytic set, that, such that this, this neighborhood is exactly this image of this projection. And semi-analytic sets, it's a, a little generalization of analytic sets to have a set given by equations, and then the semi-analytic, for instance, can, can see as a complement of analytic sets or 
still given by inequalities in terms of analytic uh, functions. In subanalytic, it's a little more general. This is, in fact, uh, uh, this definition uh, able to that the, the is in such a way that the subanalytic sets can be stable with respect to the projections, for example. And uh, uh, here you will uh, not you are interested in speak about locally. We said locally the, the, in the language uh, of, uh, of jams. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would like to bring some motivation for the approach this work. Then the first motivation is the conical topological structure. This this uh, no theorem. It's a very new tool in order to detect. Uh, the the topology of a given set nearby of some point. Right? This theorem say that if you take a small neighborhood of X and then, then some point, uh, uh, this is subanalytic homeomorphism, homeomorphism with this structure to the cone of the intersection of X with this with a sphere of the same region, okay? So this link, uh, you can see that this determines, it completely determines the topology of the J. So if you are interested in decodify the topological type of the J nearby of the point, so the, it's enough to take this object uh, called the link. Okay. Um, so uh, a question in the metric point of view is natural to ask if you have uh, some extension of this theorem, if you consider now X as, uh, as a metric space. So then this um, the X means uh, the distance given by the infimal of the all lengths of path that's connected the two points x1 and x2 okay this uh, for subanalytic sets and uh, algebraic or same algebraic and analytic it is know that uh, this distance is well defined in fact uh, for instance since s can be triangulated so you can it's possible to find the rectification Fibre paths connecting points. Okay, so the question is, uh, the natural question is to, to have, uh, suppose to have X as a metric space given by this distance, it's metric equivalent to the cone on the link, and then the distance D is the distance induced by the distance of the link of the cone also. So, this question, uh, now you have uh, um, more, uh, uh, because when you speak about the topological conical structure, it's not take care about the distance. This is just a deformation, continuum deformation in an object. But here it's more rigid. You can take this, when we speak ah, metric equivalence, um, strictly speaking, means that there is a map, like a by Lipschitz in a map, such that the distance on domain and the image are equivalent as this, with the same constant. Um, for example, uh, if you take the sum jam, X and if you look just for the conical topological structure, you're not uh, interested in to look for some zones of contact, for example, some uh, when you deform, you produce some geometry with respect to the distance, right? But the point is when you take uh, uh, 
speak about the in ellipses equivalence and one intuition going back for the Just thank you. Uh, is if you have an answer, it's positive. You say that X is metrically conical, and the intuition is that the family of links, if you change epsilon small, 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 it's the link. The family of links do not collapse fast than linearly. This is because if you take in the D side, this is just a cone. So in subset here is some intuition is if you take a cone, so if you have uh, this cone is in the other levels is the same object up to a scale of the constant. Then this is reflected if you speak about the inner Lipschitz equivalence. It's not uh, exactly the lines, but the distance must be preserved in the sense, right? For example, if you take the image of F that this, then maybe you have some object, but in such way, the distance are corresponding, are preserved, if it corresponds objects of the link and there are no other link. Okay. Uh, let me give some examples. Of, for example, if you take X, the frame image of the homogeneous polynomial, it's, it's conical. Okay, so if you take K equal to A or the set of complex number, so easy to see that. It's not, uh, but it's simple to produce uh, no singular gems that's not conical, for example. If you take this set and you have uh, this set, is, that is not conical property. For example, in the real case, this is just a revolution surface. If you take this and this, for example, if you take the Z, this surface is tangent to the this axis, okay? But uh, this in real case is explicitly an object that not collapse, uh, that collapse fast than linear, but in the complex case, it's not, not quite immediately, but in fact, now, if you think about the complex number, the link, it's an object in the five dimensional sphere. It's not uh, to be a thing. And then you can get some object on the link. In the fact, it's precisely the real part. Observe that the real part of this is, uh, of course, a subconjunct if you think about complex number. And then this object give a no contract loop fast than linear on X. But this gives a, a, some obstruction in the conical for this set. This must be proved, but it's uh, susceptible this. And then this, uh, our edge show has the, some relation of topology with the metric on this X. Uh, I think it's good uh, I take this is a relatively old question. This, let me try some works about this. this for example, in 2000 and 2002, Big Bry, Jean Paul Bracelet mm, created some metric homology for conical isolated singularities and later for more general in the metric homology. The, the idea of this metric homology is just to detect. Uh, conical obstructions, for example. In general, it's to, it's to study the, how is the behavior of the metric type of some gem, but also motivate for to, uh, and we speak about this, have homeomorphism and object on the link. So it's natural before to check to have a homeomorphism, 
to say to see if you have uh, homology groups are isomorph, the fundamental groups are uh, isomorphic, and so on, because otherwise. And then this homology, um, I put this term, it's in particular for conical singularities, these cycles in this homology is not, uh, is trivial. So it's like, uh, this is some general idea, this, this effect of this homology. In 2008-2009, in this period, Lev Birbra and Fernandes and Neumann showed that no metrically conical properties, in fact, is common. And this, consider, for instance, this example. If you take X, the Bryce corn surface, he shows, they show that this object is conical. Conical is metrical in the symmetric sense. It's, uh, equivalent to say that B equal to C. It's like this condition, otherwise you have no have conical obstruction. So in some way you can see that it's not a generic property. It's easy to take some germ and you check that you have a conical obstruction. So it's this, this beautiful result uh, was generalized for Tomohiro Kuma. He showed this also is true for isolated complex intersection to face bright corns. And also is this set has conical properties if and only if, it is if and only if this last exponents are equal. In other way, it means that uh, since this object is weighted homogeneous, then this is equivalent to say that the two lowest heights are equal. If you think about weighted homogeneous sets. This is exactly the case. This is an example of the weighted homogeneous jets. Okay. And then 2010, B. Bray Fernandes and Neumann introduced the objects called separation sets and fast loops that are magical invariant of the singularities. And uh, the separation set, for example, for this come give, give intuition is some suppose to have an object is homeomorphic to a sphere, but you have some contact in this point. It's it's like you have some homeomorphism and then they equal to in this process of the deformation collapse this object. So this in definition of the Big Brother Fernandes Neumann co uh, correspond to a separation set. This is means because this object in the, its dimension has density no zero, this has density no zero, but this object has density zero. In fact, uh, they give an equations for this object. Okay. And then 2012, Big Brian Norman Pichon uh, and uh, write this very nice work that give in fact the classification of the normal surface singularities considering the think thing decomposition. The think thing decomposition it's, well, it's just some ingenuous idea. It means that you can decompose the germ in the thick part like this, and the thin part, and the thin part is the subgen that contain a lot of the metric information about this gen. Okay. At the point inter interesting in there, there is a for normal surface singularities, he showed that the conical property it means that exactly these thin parts are empty. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to, that this, uh, there is a, all the works, nice works in the progress in high dimension, but in, I, I choose to skip this for, for question of the time. But I, I, I try this, I, I bring it in, in order to give some idea to how to, uh, how to the progress of this subject. Okay, uh, so the, we, a intuitive notion about this is given a conical obstruction for a germ, 
it only has necessarily the high contact zones and subgerms that cannot be rectified inside of X for a linear behavior. This is some intuition that, for, for example, we have this object. If you try to rectify in the order to get some linear collapse, it's not able to do that to this object. And motivated by this point of high contact, effectively starting the talk, um, uh, the approach of this work is to consider the study of this behavioral metric, uh, minet, minet, metric behavior of germs, considering the contact and the contact of arcs. And so the, this definition has two arcs, that's arcs, analytic arcs can be taken, uniformly parametrized. You can define the tangent order or contact given by the order of the distance of this arc. In the, uh, in the case, this can be take the outer distance, the ambient, or the distance given by the geodesic. The good point here, if you take this, if you have a germ with an analytic structure, this number, in fact, is well defined because these functions are, you can take uh, Fouisier expansions of these functions. You can extract the number as measure exactly this uh, contact. Okay, so in this direction, the first result that you, you get is the following. It's the, the general idea is uh, how to get uh, all the Lipschitz geometry information from the arcs, in fact. It's, it's embedded in the space of arcs. One well, first result is the following. You can detect, uh, you, show can, you can detect the some homeomorphism, not exactly necessarily metric homeomorphism. You have some criterion. One condition for F to be by Lipschitz, uh, uh, to have uh, the definition in the work of uh, the talk of Professor John Olnek and Sampaio also, uh, let me uh, remind again if you a map is called by Lipschitz when the distance and the domain and image are equivalent. This is equivalent and distance uniformly. So one condition is, uh, oops, is the first one is if you have a bi homeomorphism, so it's need to have the distance, if we speak about jams, the distance with the point must be preserved. This is the this necessary condition. In all the words it means that the hagial behavior is it's preserved from the bi homeomorphism, but it's not enough. In fact, you need to control also the angle um, along of this map. So for to get a suffici sufficient condition, you have this following result. A map F is by Lipschitz if the radial distance is preserved with the same constant. And moreover, the contact of arcs in domain of the image is the same for any pair of arcs. So it uh, it's, can be, uh, it will be useful for some next criterion, but then if we speak about uh, homeomorphism with some structure, then you can take this criterion, right? The idea of the proof of this criterion is take some uh, called no Lipschitz locus related with this map, no, no Lipschitz locus is a germ, and then you can show this germ is also subanalytic. Then you use uh, the arc selection lemma. It's one step. But uh, this is uh, 
The point you to take use the arc selection lemma. Uh, it is, for instance, given some no Lipschitz behavior of the map, it's you need to show that this no Lipschitz behavior is remains if you parametrize the arcs uniformly. This is the not simple point to, to give some uh, work for to that. For to, to, to get the arcs, it's not a problem, but to show that he, this equality holds uniformly is uh, the point of the, this result. Okay. So, and how I say in the abstract, in the title of the talk, it's uh, the idea is to study the, the germs of the metric point of view considering Horn. The Horn, it's, uh, it's, it's the object like this, it's, it's just an, um, an object. Let me give you the definition, it's, it's better to say. The Horn, you can say the Horn, if you take a base, this means the zero set of this, it's a hyperplane. So a horn is a union of the horizontal slices of this. Then you take some arcs, so take points in the base, and then you take go down these arcs, considering this parametrization. And then you can see that arcs can be seen as an uh, foliation of the horn. Right, this can be given by equation, but to focus on all interest, I, I prefer to write in this way, like uh, some given but some foliation of arcs. In this arcs, I can split them to down. We have a point, we have this parametrization. Then you extend this notion, is this is standard horn, and you say that a germ is a metric horn, new horn, if this by Lipsch is equivalent to a standard horn for some base. So it's then if you speak the inner, and as you say uh, inner, you or, or outer distance speak the uh, for inner metric, you just write the EM8 mean. This means this inner metric uh, horn. And of course, if X is the base of a sphere, then the, this uh, it's called the inner standard horn, right? So it's just, it's the standard horn has explicit equations in easy way. For example, if you, you take horn nu of the some this r to the n plus one. Is okay. Thank you. Right. Um, for example, uh, S M. So S M minus one. Yes. You have this equation for a standard horn. Okay. It's of course a same algebraic set. <clears throat> okay, from this approach, then let me speak about some properties. It's easy properties, but sometimes can be good in order to detect it. For example, you can speak about diameter of a germ of the infimum of the contacts. It means if you have a small contact, this number, this big, it means you have a large distance. This is a Noah Archimedean set. So if you have, there is arcs, if you take the arcs, have, have the small distance, then this corresponds to the diameter. So it's easy to see, have x is a inematic horn, then the diameter is equal to nu. So geometer, for example, is, can be seen as first object for to detect uh, the conical, if object is conical or not, it's, it's, it's Immediate to see have if diameter of a gem is greater than one. So this 
imply this x is not conical. Okay, but it is so far off to be enough because, for example, for all complex analytic sets. Uh, the diameter is equal to one, one always, because the, the tangent part is not degenerated. So, <clears throat> the second property is if you have X uh, horn, if connect compact link, if contact for some arcs is equal to one, then is immediately is conical, it's an inimetric horn of one, exponent one. Just, it's enough to take two arcs, okay? And then uh, all the properties, eight point can be presented after the intersection of, you take a slice, intersect some vertical arc of the foliation. So you can describe all the points of horns in this way. And you have natural projections for this horn for the line, for this horn for the X. Okay? The first one is Lipschitz, the second is continuous projections. This is in this beautiful. And uh, all the properties, if you take a union of closed gaps, so that the union is, if subset or sub gam is uh, in a metric horn, then it's a, the gem is also in a metric relief horn. This for specifically about in a metric. Okay, so the, the first theorem is uh, the following. It's the question also uh, motivated, motivated by the, the topological conical structures. It means that if link determines the, the topological type completely, we can ask about this. Suppose we have a two bases, and suppose that these gams are bilipses or metrically equivalent. Is it true that the horns are bilipses equivalent also? This, uh, the answer is positive. In fact, for horns, this is a good thing. The link, the metric type of the link determines completely the metric type of the horn. Okay? Uh, but the, let's speak about the. the the proof of this example, so if just uh, mention this, if you hack a basis, you have this. Basically, you just take a expected map, you define this map given by the U from Fx. So this is by Lipschitz. So this defines immediately maps between horns. Okay. So it's uh, with some computation you can show that this map is by Lipschitz. In fact, it's if its map is outer or even ambient, this map also is ambient. You can take to ambient. This direction is immediate, but the other direction is not quite simple because you have some problem in this direction in general. If you have, suppose, we have now you can you can erase this exponent because obviously if you have a bilipse map, this exponent is the same. So to have a bilipse map, you cannot conclude directly that the base are bilipses because there is some immediate problem because this map cannot, is not need to preserve these slices. So, um, you do not, do not have this, this uh, bilipse homeomorphism directly from the map. Uh, let's mention the fact, um, I think, in Guillaume Vallette, 
in 2007, I think, I'm not sure, he showed that you have a bi Lipschitz map for same algebraic or subanalytic germs, you can replace on the map such that they preserve these slices. But here you, you can get a proof in more easy ways. Just uh, work on vertical foliation. And the map for to do that for us, let me give some idea what happened. You have a horn, you take a slice, so you take a vertical arc, so you have a bi lips map. So this image, of course, not be to slice. But since there is a vertical arc, because it's also a horn, so this intersect this is slice in just one point, state i. Uh, let me say, first take the point in this slice, given the image, this point. So for this point, take an arc or orbed arc. And then he gives a map from the slice and another slice. This is like an rectification. If a point is outside of the slice, you can take the point because the intersection of this arc with this slice is just one point. So this map is well defined. It, it, it's easy to see uh, that the map is, the inverse map is, is basically is defined also from this construction. So, you can check this map is by Lipschitz. Right? But it's important that this is subanalytic. You need some structures. If not structured, you can have bad behavior in these slides. This can, this can change in not good ways. Okay. So, uh, one result that you have from this approach of language of defoliation is the following. Take X as subanalytic germ. In some sense is natural because horns can be given by the expected foliation. Just take off arcs. So if you have a germ, you can speak about the, the foliation by arcs. Always exist, for example, to take the topological, the theorem, the cone on the link, the image of the lines given a foliation from the homeomorphism, but give a foliation. So the subset um, is called a good foliation, and then I'll speak with things good here. If you have the following, first one is the this foliation is subanalytic. This means that the um, For example, days, three minutes. Oh, wow. Obrigado. So, you take a jam. So, if you uh, take uh, um, the set of arcs coven X, you say this is subanalytic, for example, if there is a subanalytic map of the cone of the link. The subanalytic map such that the image of this map is the support of the foliage. This means, but it's more, more strong. It means that you have to take a line, is the image is an arc of this given foliage. Okay. And then the second property is for in line of the tangent cone. If this means within tangent cone, you can take a neighborhood of this direction, such that this neighborhood contains all the arcs of the foliation. Let me give uh, the example for to understand the second property. Foliation can bad can have bad behavior. The first one is not exactly bad, but suppose you have the first quadrant and then take the foliation by parabolas. In fact, you can, you can foliate not exactly the closed quadrant, right? This, this line not can be covered, 
but you can cover uh, at, uh, except this outside of this line. But this object is of course conical, but in the, if you have cover up of parabolas, observe that all arcs are tangent in this foliation. So this foliation does not reflect the metric type exactly of the, this set. This is a, it's not a good choice in order to understand what happened, right? And uh, but you can take uh, another example. Take the cone. Suppose you have opened the cone along of take out on line. You can take a foliation that's no tangent. This foliation is no tangent, but it has a problem. This uh, this foliation has contact too with this, but this now the situation is. It is also covered this quadrant, but all arcs are tangent of this, the middle of the quadrant. But this happened like this. This can be to go around almost tangent, but has Jeremy's tangent to this. So it is impossible to take a horn get all these arcs in this foliation. It's the other problem of the situation. But this, uh, an example on this property is not satisfied, okay? So you prove the following. Let's have, let's if you take a subanalytic set, the link connects, connected link, then if you have a good, no tangent foliation, so the germ is inematically conical. This if and only if. But, uh, observe that this direction two implies one is immediately, but it takes just the image for this this uh, bilip homeomorphism. But the the other direction, it need to work more. And then you can take some good consequences of this. For example, take uh, this complex or real analytic set. So this is conical. It's just because the tangent cone this set is the hyperplane, then you can take the radial foliation explicitly for this set. To have a radial foliation, he has a no tangent foliation, then this set, all the set is conical. This is a, a kind of generalization of the weighted homogeneous, because in this case, the lowest rates are equal. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes to finish. Okay, uh, I think I can stop here. Thank you for attention of all. Thank you very much. Let's see first if we have questions from people online. Are there any questions? Uh, hi, Rodrigo. No. Hi. So, uh, do you think you can prove uh, the Neumann Pichon, uh, Neumann and Pichon conjecture about uh, the locally metrically conicalness. Uh, do you know that conjecture? Yes. Yeah, met locally metrically conical implies a metrically conical. Yeah, yes. Because you, this looks like a, more or less you have the, you, you the have, answer, right? You have a uh, uh, progress like. in this direction. Uh, since the time not permit, but uh, I have some um, answer, positive answer in this direction. In fact, you show that you can, if you take an open cover of the link, such that for it open, take a foliation, the good one, not, uh, yes, take a foliation like this, it's not exactly no tangent, and take an open cover, it's suppose that the open cover is comp compatible with this foliation. So if you can take, uh, 
you can construct auxiliar functions that for each neighborhood, in fact, you can glue these neighborhoods in order to get the global conical. Yes. But uh, the point is, uh, if you take the hypothesis that this is compatible, you have. But you need to show yeah, some kind that, of uh, this is the a problem I see, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe for surface, uh, easy. But yes, but, but yes. I don't know. Even guys, I for for high dimension on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let us thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Oi, Renato. Tudo bom? Olá, amigo. Tudo bem? We start in two minutes, ok? Ah, yeah, okay. More, more two minutes, please. Ok. Thank you. Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Luiz Renato Gonçalves Dias from Universidade Federal de Uberlândia, 
He will talk about linear operators and semi-algebraic global diffeomorphisms. Please, Renato. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organized committee for the opportunity to talk about my work. This is a joint work with uh, Francisco Brown from Universidade Federal de São Carlos and with uh, Jean Venato Santos from Universidade Federal de Berlândia. This is a preprint disponible in on archive. The plan of my talk is the following one. Firstly, I talk about some, uh, I talk about two open problems related to our results. After I present the, the main results of your work, then I explain some motivation of your work, and finally, I give some ideas of the proofs. So the first open problem I would like to present here is the Jacobian conjecture. So the Jacobian conjecture states the following one. If you, you have a non-singular polynomial mapping from Cn to Cn, then F is an automorphism. So this is an open problem proposed by Kelly. And you have uh, several problems and uh, several reductions related to the Jacobian conjecture. For instance, we know that to prove the Jacobian conjecture is enough to prove that F is an injective mapping. In other words, if you have a non-singular polynomial mapping from Cn to Cn, if F is an injective mapping, then F is an automorphism. So this is the first open problem related to our work. Just to give you a reference about this problem, we have the book of Van den Ness, Polynomial Automorphism, and the Jacobian conjecture. Another open problem related to our work is the Yellow-Neff conjecture in the real case. So just a motivation, as in the complex case, we can ask if it's true that on non-singular polynomial mapping, that F is an objective mapping. This question is false. You have, for instance, the example from pin two, where pin two present on polynomial mapping from R2 to R2. F is non singular, but F is not an invertible mapping. In the real case, you have the Yolonek conjecture on open problem. To, to present the Yolonek conjecture, you need some definitions. So, given <coughs> On difference on, on, on mapping from Kn to Kn, K the real or the complex numbers, then we define the yellow neck set in the following way. We say that if we say that F is proper at Y in Kn, if it's possible to find a neighborhood V of Y, so that the pin image of the close of V is on compact set. With this, you can define the non-proper set with the not by SF, the set of the points in Kn, such that F is not proper. This is called the non-proper set of F, also now as the Yolonek set of F. Uh, some words about this set. For instance, if you have a semi-algebraic mapping, then the yellow next set is on semi-algebraic set. So it makes sense to consider the dimension and the co-dimension of the yellow next set. 
in particular, from a result of yellow neck. This is a particular case of the result of yellow neck. You know that if f is on polynomial map from cn to cn, then the non proper set as f is either empty or a hypersurface. With this, we can state the yellow neck conjecture of uh, an open problem. If you have a non singular polynomial map, if the codimension of the no proper set is greater than or equal to two, then f is on bijective mapping or f is on diffeomorphism. This is an open problem, and we have some results related to this conjecture. For instance, yellow net prove, proves that conjecture two is two if the codimension with the additional hypothesis that the codimension of the yellow neck set is greater than or equal to three. Uh, we remark that the proof also worked for the similar algebraic case, but the conclusion is that F is on injective mapping. Uh, yellow neck also proved that the conjecture two is true for any equal to two. And the more interest, you want to prove that the conjecture two implies the Jacobian conjecture. In other words, if the conjecture two is true for any n, then the Jacobian conjecture is true for any n. So this is the two open problems which I would to talk here. And now I will start to present some definitions of uh, our results, relate to our results. But before, just a remark, as in the complex case, in the real case, we have some reductions to the Yelonex conjecture, for instance. We know that if f is on non-singular polynomial mapping and the f is on injective mapping, then F is on bijective map. In particular, to prove the yellow neck conjecture is enough to prove that F is on injective map. Now, we state some definition to our results. We denote by C infinity Rn, the space of C infinite functions defined on Rn, and by En, the space of the analytic function on Cn. Now we define some operators related to F. So give uh, C infinity mapping, respect to an analytic mapping. Then for I, for some means I, we do not by delta I F, the following operator for any function g, you consider the following function delta i g is exactly the determinant of the Jacobian of the mapping f i, f i minus one, g, f i plus one, f n. In other words, uh, you take f, we replace the coordinate function f i by g, and you compute the, the, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of this new mapping. These are linear operators. And with this, we can state our first result. So our first result is the following one. Given a non-singular semi-algebraic mapping from Rn to Rn, such that the yellow next set has codimension greater than or equal to two, then F is on bijective mapping. If and only if you have that any minus one operators are surjective. In other words, F is on bijective mapping. If and only if the operator delta IF 
subjective for n minus one indices. In this talk, also I discuss a little about this hypothesis, the hypothesis of the codimension of SF. And in fact, we will present one example, which show that in our theorem, the hypothesis of the codimension of the Elon XF is an unnecessary condition for us. And the second result, the following, given C infinity non singular mapping, such that for some i, the operator delta if is surjective. Then, if you fix another int different, on int different of i, g, then for any non empty connect component L of the intersection of the fibers of the coordinate functions without f i f g so this has dimension two then the theorem states that the non fibers of the restriction of f j to n are connected and with this we have that n is different of two r2 just to illustrate this theorem one example in the for n equal, equal to three. So if the f is on non-singular mapping, such that for instance, the operator delta three f is surjective, then the connect components of the fibers of f i and f two, f one, f two are different of two, r two. This is just to illustrate the Theorem two. In fact, these these results about the bijective of mapping with the linear operators delta i f is not new. We have some results in the literature. For instance, we have the works of Stein for n equal to two, and the results of Krasinski in disposition for n n where they prove that for any polynomial mapping from Cn to Cn, such so that the, the Jacobian matrix, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of f equal to one, then you have that f is a polynomial automorphism. If you know it, you have that the operators delta i f is dense in Cn for n minus one indices. So with this result, it's found that the form conjecture implies the Jacobian conjecture. The conjecture is exactly there. If taken an analytic function from, from Cn to Cn, such so that the Jacobian, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of F equal to one, then the image of the n minus one operators are dense in EN. If this conjecture is true, by this result, it's found that the Jacobian conjecture is true. Just a remark. Also, Krasinski's position show the form theorem. If you have a um, polynomial map from Kn to Kn, where K is the real or the complex number, so that the, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of F equal to one, then they prove that F is on polynomial automorphism. If you know if the linear operators delta I F restricts to the polynomial map function are subjected to the polynomial function for n minus one different indices. We remark that the bijective mapping f x y equal to x x square plus one y y square plus one does not satisfy the hypothesis of this theorem because the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is not equal to one. 
but this example satisfies the condition of the or theorem one. Now let's discuss a little about the hypothesis on the our first theorem. In our first theorem, we have the hypothesis that the codimension of the Elon set is greater than or equal to two. In this example, we will show that this condition is necessary to our theory. So the example is motivated by the example of Francisco Brown and the Santos Filho. So we we'll consider here in our example, this form of three semi-algebraic functions, A, X, P, X, and the polynomial function G, Z, like that. Then you take the form of semi-algebraic map from R3 to R3, defined by this expression. The a, E, G, so on. Then this mapping is a non singular mapping. You can compute the, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of F. Then this is not a, F is not a, F is a non singular, well, no, no, F is, F is a non singular semi algebraic mapping. F is not injective. But the operators delta one and delta two are surjective. In fact, in this example, the Elon set has dimension one. Sorry, uh, the Elon set has dimension two. In other words, the codimension of the Elon set is exactly one. So this example shows that the more theory we need of this hypothesis of the for dimension of the Elon set. So now I, did the, I want to give some ideas of the proofs. So remember here the statement of the theorem two. We start with the theorem two. The theorem two is like that. If you are non singular mapping, set that the operator delta i is surjective, then you fix on j, then we want to show that the non-empty connect component of these intersections is different of two R2, and also we want to show that fj restricts to l has connected fibers. So we, we begin with the the first one, the statement of one. So the proof is motivated by the work of Alexandre Fernandes, which is a Habanal. And before I start to give the ideas of the proof, we fix some notation and some remarks. The first one is that the integral curves of the linear operator delta i in L is just the connect components of the fibers of Fj strict to L without by gamma p the integral the integral curve of delta i passing through p in other words p this is exactly on connect component of Fj, which contains P. And you have that any two points in L can be joined by a path, such so that this path has at the most finite many points of tangency with the flow of delta If. In other words, for any two points of L, we can join by a path. So that this path has at the most finite many points with, of tangents with the fibers of Fj restrict to L. 
then now we suppose by contradiction first that we suppose by contradiction that for some c in R, this set f the pre image of f j restricts to l is not connected. So you denote by R1 and R2 the two distinct connect components of fj of the fiber of fj on c and you consider p1 in r1 and p2 in r2 the idea here is to produce uh, on geometric pixels similar to the half hidden components which was defined in this paper in that paper Fernando Gutierrez y Rabanon so with this, we denote by omega p1, p2, the set of all paths join connecting p1 and p2. Ideal here means that these paths has at the most finite many points of tangents with the flow of delta i. So this ideal means exactly this. Then you fix on path in omega that minimizes the number of tangents of, with the flow of delta i f. So f j in the extreme of this path, in other words, f g applying p1 f g p2 is equal, in fact, is equal to c. Then, in particular, the restriction of Fg on the image of this path has a maximum or a minimum. Then, this form of that the set S in the interval of 0, 1, such that the sigma is turned to gamma sigma S at some point of the, the image of the path is not empty, so since uh, this has a maximum minimum, so we can take S0 as the minimum of this set. Then you have two possibilities for this minimum. The path sigma is tangent to gamma sigma S0 at sigma S0 or sigma is transversal to sigma to gamma sigma S0 at sigma S0. So in the second condition, you, about the second condition, you can use the choice of sigma, which means we can take the property, we can use the property that sigma Minimize the numbers of the tangents with the flow of delta i f, and you use the flow box theorem to show that two does not happen. So this condition does not happen. Then you will show that this condition one implies a contradiction with the surjective of the linear operator delta i f. So to do this. We consider this set now of the S in the interval 0, S0, so that the cardinality of the gamma sigma S intersection of the intersection with the path is greater than or equal to 2. This set is not empty. Since for S close enough to S0, the interval curve gamma sigma S pass from the path at least two times. So this T is not empty, and you can consider the infinite of T, which we denote by S tilde. Then you can show that S tilde is not in T, then and we're going to apply the one theorem of 
to stem on her manga to show that that the the linear operators dealt IF is not surjective. The theorem of this term and hormone this is the following one. We have that the a vector field is surjective if and only if the no integral curve of X is containing a compact set of N and also for all compact K in N, it's possible to find a compact K prime such that every compact interval on an integral curve of X with any points in K in the compact set K is containing the K prime. So the idea is to use this result to show that delta IF is not subjective with this condition of T and the S tilde. So you consider for our case K is exactly the image of the path and you take any compact K prime. The uh, integral the integral curve gamma sigma s tilde is not bound since this is a connect component of the fj. So in fact, this is homomorphic to R. So you can consider a tubular neighborhood any of this integral curve, skipping from k prime in both direction since this is homor to R and not bounded. Then by the def definition of a tilde, you have that there exists S and T close enough to S tilde, such so that the integral curve of sigma, the uh, gamma sigma S cuts at least to twice the compact K but in in this between it skates to k prime. In other words, this condition is not true for our case, which means that our linear operator is not surjective, which gives which gives our contradiction with the hypothesis of theorem. So th this is just some words about the proof. To prove this some ideas of the statement, some ideas of the proof of statement two of theorem two. We know here the theorem two and the statement two. The idea is to show that L is different of two R two. But this is followed by the statement one. Since you have that the, the fibers of Fj restrict to L are different of 2R. We remember that the, from this statement one, the fibers of Fj are connect sets. So these fibers are different of 2R. And these fibers are closed in Rn. And the image of Fj restrict to L is on integral, so is on contractible set. Then you can show that this restriction effect is on vibration. Then in particular, L is homomorphic to different of two R2. Or we can apply, for instance, on theorem of from two binds a area to show that in fact Fj is on vibration. Consequently, L is different of two R2. So if this were proved stating two of theorem two, the t some words about the theorem one, but the theorem one followed by the theorem two and from on result of the Fernandes, Makira and the Santos, some words here. 
So from the theorem, theorem two, you have that any non-empty com empty component of the set is different of two or two. Then by um, result of Fernandes, Maquet and Venato Santos, you have that the F is a different morphism. So in this implication, the linear operates are subjective for n minus one. It implies that F is bijectives formed by theorem two and Fernando Maqueira and Venato Santos result. And in this implication, if it's bijective implies the the selective of linear operator is direct consequence. So with this, I finish my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. Are there questions? Colleagues that are online, that are questions? No? So let us thank the speaker again. Thank you, Renato. Thank you. So we have a break now. We come back at uh, 4.40. Yes? Yes. So this is a correction, the next uh, talk is at 4.50. Thank you.